All right, folks, thank you so much for being here. I have a huge and special welcome to give to you. Um, I was at this conference in 2018, and it was career changing for me. And uh, I get the same feeling from this moment already, just from this morning. It's such a fertile ground for advocacy and our research. So um, I, I hope that you guys can have a great experience as I did in 2018 uh, and since. So I am, for the next 75 minutes or so, I'm gonna help us move through these five incredible presentations that you're about to hear on policy and governance approaches to the problems and opportunities that we're faced with here. Um, I was in another panel a couple of panels ago, and the question was, have you brought any of these ideas to government? <laughs> and uh, an economist was struggling with that question. These folks uh, have some answers, I think, to that question, so I look forward to hearing them. I I'm just gonna announce or let you know the names and the affiliations of these folks. I, I won't read the bios, obviously you have of those and then we'll get started. So uh, Valerie Mar Marcel is with the New Producers Group in Chatham House, so she'll be talking with us first. Kelim Shaw at the University of Delaware. Fergus Green, University College London. Michelle Bastamante, have I pronounced your name correctly? Close. Bestamante, excellent, Natural Resources Defense Council. And then finally, Max Cohen, who is at the University of British Columbia. So I'm going to turn it over to them with thanks. And by the way, my name is Angela Carter. I'm an associate prof at the University of Waterloo and also um, an energy transition specialist now at the International Institute for Sustainable Development. So uh, it is a pleasure to meet you all. I hope we get a chance to connect. So Valerie, please go ahead. So it's lovely to be here. I was also at the 2018 conference and, and uh, really happy to be back here in person. Uh, it feels good. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm talking about a co-authored paper uh, that's focused on emerging oil and gas producers uh, in the transition. Um, so I think our concern came from the fact that a lot of the supply side transition thinking is focused on established producers. Um, and we felt that emerging oil and gas producers are a really different subset and facing really different issues. Um, and so we looked at the challenges that they face, the policy dilemmas that they face in the transition. Um, and it's based on insights gained from interviews with government officials from these countries and also from workshops and trainings that we've organized through the New Producers Group. Uh, and briefly, the New Producers Group is a peer-to-peer -peer government network, like a South-South peer-to-peer program for almost 30 countries that are new to the oil and gas sector. Um, and the, what we've seen in those discussions is really that they have a, a desire to develop their petroleum resources. Um, they also have a desire to prepare for the transition. Uh, and to build that climate resilience. So there's a duality there in, in their sort of policy focus, um, but that they really have some significant capacity challenges in how to navigate either of those um, policy goals. So just to talk a little bit about who these emerging producers are, um, this is the list of countries that we, that we work with. Um, and almost half of them are in green, and those are exploration countries. Uh, the ones in yellow are the ones that have discovered significant uh, oil and made significant oil and gas discoveries, and the ones in purple are early producers. But in this paper, we were really more interested in the ones that are in the de development stage or early production because they're at a really critical policy juncture. They're not yet dependent on the oil sector or the gas sector, and they're, 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 the decisions that they make at the beginning of this process are, are really important for their development path. Um, so going back just to the group generally, um, many of them are low-income countries, um, and so or lower-income countries. And so they're really pinning the, their hopes on the sector as a, a source of, of revenues. Um, and that's really the focus that they have. Um, they are different, as I said, from uh, established producers because they're not exporting their, or their energy needs, they're importing them. Um, many of them have very low access to e energy. Uh, the African uh, contingent is really dependent on biomass. The Caribbean small states in our group have very good access to energy, but a lot of it is heavy fuel oil. Uh, 
And so there's really an interest, I think, uh, from a lot of the policymakers on, um, you know, wanting to generate domestically produced a a energy and for it to be cleaner than the current energy mix and, and safer. The group as a whole accounts for 1.7% of global GHGs, so really tiny climate footprint. Um, one question is what happens to that when they develop their, their oil and gas resources, of course. Uh, but when you look at the per capita emissions, they're also extremely low. Um, and um, you have the world at the bottom there, the world average. The Caribbean small states are, are generally uh, high, higher per capita. And what's interesting is that several members in the group um, are carbon sinks. So they have huge forest to land cover. Um, and so they really have a duality in their like policy drivers. They, they want to be oil and gas exporters and generate revenues from that. And they also want rewards for managing their forest and they want to remain carbon negative. Um, so it's quite a different kind of policy situation compared to to the established producers. They're very vulnerable to climate impacts. The, the, the whole group are the ones that are in color in this chart. And so almost all of them are in the, the worst quadrant, which is high vulnerability and low readiness. And that includes all the countries that are developing those uh, significant discoveries that I mentioned in the first slide. Um, so uh, that they, they really need investment and adaptation. And I think what's, what's interesting also to note is that because they are so marginal, um, the, the reserves that they have even are still marginal in relation to, um, to, to global, um, global numbers, that any mitigation efforts that they make are, is not, are not going to reduce their own climate vulnerability or their vulnerability to climate impacts. Um, so, yeah, so basically, you know, the conclusion is they're really not legacy uh, producers. So they have very limited dependence on the sector. And what's interesting is also that they, because they're starting today, they have the benefit of hindsight and they really are aware of uh, resource curse risks. Uh, they are aware of transition risks. Um, but we do find a big difference between um, officials like technocrats, government officials and politicians, uh, you know, uh, elected MPs uh, think and, and speak very differently about those two types of risks. Um, so there's really that desire to develop their petroleum resources for, for revenues, first and foremost, when you ask them about what is, what is, what, what are you hoping to get from the petroleum sector? It's revenues for growth in every case. Uh, but it's also domestic energy and to a lesser extent uh, linkages with the petroleum sector. So supply chain linkages, uh, value chain linkages like, you know, I, I think the, the interest in, in refining or processing the oil and gas is much less than it would have been uh, before awareness of the transition. Um, but they also are really driven by the idea of um, forging a new path of building resilience in the transition. So using revenues, export revenues for green growth uh, or to build resilience. So it's, it's an interesting kind of um, uh, a subset of countries. So the policies, the policy challenge that they have is essentially that they are, it's difficult for them to go down the low carbon route because they are not attracting climate finance, broadly speaking. They're not attracting transition finance or transition support. Um, they're not, you know, Nigeria is going to attract a lot more interest in managing a transition than a small marginal new producer. Um, so they, they basically don't have alternative pathways. So when we surveyed the countries, um, the governments, on whether they had a plan B, whether they had a non-oil development plan, uh, pathway. Um, and 80 percent of them said no. And that's even the countries that are at the exploration stage that are really frontier countries and have low prospects for their sector taking off. Um, 
and they need the, and they need revenues. So going down that low carbon route is is difficult for them because they just don't have it's it's not concrete and it's not going to generate revenues now. They also have difficulty going down the sort of midway route, uh, which would be somewhere between uh, developing your oil and gas as fast as you can and the low carbon route. Um, so I think the, the challenge for that is that there is the element of political promises made about developing oil and gas and the kinds of windfalls it is going to generate. So there's a bit of a lock-in to, to that kind of um, pathway, like a political lock-in, I should say. Um, there's, I think, a lack of uh, capacity to assess the risks of the petroleum sector. So to stress test their plans, um, fiscally, um, economically, um, it's, uh, that's a challenge. Um, and then it's also that they're not getting uh, support for um, how, how, basically how to develop their petroleum sector differently so it could be the lowest emission standard. So emerging producers theoretically would have the ability to develop, the, to establish a sector as lowest emissions, but they're not, getting the, they're not getting support for that because there's been a general withdrawal of uh, multilateral development banks and donor development agencies from, from supporting them. Uh, and they don't have support with mapping out a plan to net zero. So the, the risk is that by default, if they can't pursue those two plans, that they go down the route of developing their oil and gas as fast as they can uh, with the risks that are involved in that. So thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. So I'm going to talk about some work that I've been doing for the last couple of years um, on institutional uh, governance, uh, institutional climate governance. In perhaps a, um, perhaps this is almost like a deep dive case study of what was just said in, in many ways. Um, so I hope I'm not repeating too much. Um, but I've been doing some work in the Guyana Shield countries that were mentioned. And just to remind us, um, as was said before, um, these are the countries that I've been focusing on. Um, this part of the world here is South America, uh, Suriname, Guyana, and then this little dot here is uh, Trinidad and Tobago. And this is just illustrative of the kind of upstream investment that's happening. It's a very active, very dynamic uh, uh, field. Um, and a lot of the major global players, um, as you can see, uh, um, are highlighted here. All right. Um, so almost, I'll start here. So this is always sort of my baseline in this particular part of the world in terms of small producers. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago, very small but important producer in this part of the world. Um, and it has a hundred year history of oil and gas. Um, and it's almost like a poster child of, sort of a lot of things that could have been done better. Right, and they're sort of finding that out now, um, given that they're now producing 70% less crude oil than they have been in previous years. And now there's a significant thrust by the government there to um, figure out how to diversify the economy away from, um, from oil. Natural gas is still pretty okay, but clearly you can see that uh, GHG emissions is, is always like notoriously um, cited um, with places like Bahrain and, and so on as highest G, uh, GHGs per capita because it's so small, right? Um, um, but to sort of my interests, um, it does have a deep institutional governance um, uh, regime um, over dec you know, developed over decades for the energy sector. The climate piece is a little bit newer, but still there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle um, here, you know, the NDCs, renewable targets, uh, national climate policy that's more than a decade old, um, and so on. So it is uh, reasonably robust when you start thinking about uh, institutional governance for the energy sector and then sort of some of the environmental and climate uh, mitigation pieces. Now, so then we have Guyana, which is 
uh, new kid on the block, a very new producer. First discoveries uh, in 2015. Um, but significant amounts of reserves, if brought to market over the next decade or two, valued over 130 billion US dollars. And this is significant for a very small, uh, small country, less than a million people. It's very, very, it's, it's, it's life changing, right? Um, at the conference of the Americas a couple of months ago uh, with President Biden, um, the Prime Minister of Guyana said they have all intents to, um, to bring to market all of this. All right. So, so I guess the starting point here is not, you know, what can we do to keep it in the ground, but sort of my starting point is, okay, if this is the situation, how can we do this in a responsible way, if that, if, if that is even a possibility? All right. Um, the flip side of this is Guyana has over 87% of natural forest reserve. It's one of five Amazonia countries in South America that's classified as high forest, low deforestation. And this carbon sink potential um, is valued, ecosystem services is valued at about 40 to 54 billion US annually, which is not insignificant, all right? Um, so there's sort of two things going on here, right? The fact that the country is going to go, is going guns to develop these uh, oil and gas reserves, and then the natural carbon sink sort of uh, potential, um, not potential, but uh, reality of the country, and juxtaposing those two things. So the new government that came in in 2020 um, has put together what they're calling a low carbon development strategy 2030 which is meant to balance um, those two pieces, the carbon sink piece, and then the uh, exploration and bringing to market those reserves, um, and using the dividends, as I said, using the dividends of, that, of, um, of, of, of marketing that for uh, developing a low carbon development pathway for the country, all right? And there are four components of it creating new incentives for a low carbon economy, protecting against climate change and biodiversity loss, aligning with global climate and biodiversity goals, and stimulating clean energy and low carbon development. Um, so they're always trying, trying to do three things here. Trying to monetize the ecosystem ser services of the carbon sink, trying to uh, bring to market all of the reserves that they have very quickly, and then translate that, uh, those, those dividends into uh, low carbon, clean, uh, diversified development for the country, all right? So it's almost like walking, you know, walking and chewing gum, as they say, right? Um, so given that, um, I've been looking at, all right, so if that's the case, what kind, what's it in the evolving institutional climate governance regime like in order to achieve all that is being said here and avoid the resource curse and whatnot, as we well know in other parts of the country. So I've actually, you know, over the last couple of years been uh, working very closely with a couple of these, um, a couple of these agencies, the Office for Climate Change, which is uh, under the, directly under the office of the president, reports directly to the president's office, uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources and the Environment, uh, which combines its uh, forestry uh, uh, function, its uh, re a regulatory function, as well as a policy function with the uh, Environmental Management Agency, and then sort of a multi-pronged uh, National Climate Change Committee, which is really a sort of a technical committee that advises, so it has an advisory function, national advisory function, right? Um, so looking at that, sort of thinking about the administration of policy, if you would, right? Um, how do we go about doing that? So in this sort of framework uh, for thinking about the progress, the progress along an institutional governance of climate line, Right, I think about two things. Um, one is so within the operating environment that sort of is the reality of the day, there's two sort of concepts. One is sort of a, a, a systemic level concept of institutional resilience, right? So how do we build a, a governance regime that has uh, resilient institutions? That will 
um, face the test of changing political administrations and political philosophies and so on. All right, so that's one level. And the other sort of intersecting level is uh, that organizational level of how do you uh, think about the uh, value creating bureaucracy itself, right? So this is sort of the administration of policy piece, okay? Um, and, and sort of like, um, you know, uh, folks in public administration call this uh, the new governance model, right? How do we move away from uh, old sort of stuffy bureaucratic structures to more dynamic, flexible, agile kinds of structures as well um, to, to create this dynamism in the, the overall um, sort of um, uh, climate governance, right? Um, and what we find really quickly, especially when I look at those three um, uh, climate-focused actors that I mentioned, um, the five things that we see happening that um, there's pros and cons or, or strengths and weaknesses to institutional governance progress. One is sort of internally the legalities and the mandates of different actors in that uh, institution, uh, that governance network, right? Um, there's a lot of contentions around um, legal mandates of ministries, agencies, boards, special committees, and so on. Um, that tends to disrupt the effectiveness and the efficiency of how governance works. Uh, the other one is coordination. So that's also sort of linked to that, right? So coordination of the numbers of primary actors, secondary actors, tertiary actors, then all of the, uh, the stakeholders outside of formal governance um, um, as well. Um, that coordination element um, um, is sort of, you know, iffy right now, right? And there's also an external and a, a domestic dimension to uh, coordination of, of a governance regime. Domestically, we can understand sort of the coordination of the key actors. But if we think about externally, um, for example, there's a, there's a situation where Guyana is a South American country, but it's also um, a member of the CARICOM, which is the Caribbean common market, right? For historical and cultural reasons uh, and geography, right? But many of the Caribbean island countries have moved towards zero, um, zero carbon um, statements, have moved towards uh, marketing themselves, for example, their tourism sectors as green islands, green economies, and so on, right? Um, while Guyana is moving fully into the oil and gas um, sector. So how does this mesh in that kind of regional kind of situation? How is that coordinated, right? Um, so there's issues like that can arise. Alignment. Alignment is another issue. Agency and access, for example, the Office for Climate Change, which is directly under the president, which can raise a lot of questions about transparency and accountability and then resources and power. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions more specifically on that later. Thank you. Great. Um, so I'm going to be talking about why we need a new norm um, against new fossil fuel projects. And this is joint work with my colleague Steve Pye from the UCL Energy Institute. And just to be clear, um, our, our paper is going to cover um, both fossil fuel demand and fossil fuel supply, though I'm mostly going to talk about fossil fuel supply today for obvious reasons. So I want to do three things. Um, I want to talk about like the case, like why there should be no fossil fuel projects, but I'm going to fly through that very, very quickly, largely take it as read for this audience. We can maybe discuss some of the nuances in the Q&A. The second thing, just to sort of briefly give a kind of crude political economy model of why there are new fossil fuel projects being developed. And again, that's going to be sort of fairly quick. Um, and then talk about why we should concentrate on building an, a norm against new fossil fuel projects. So again, I'm going to, so I'm going to fly through this pretty quickly, but clearly there, this is coal-fired power stations, lots of new coal-fired power stations in development, sort of pre-construction and construction. Um, lots of companies uh, with um, developing new oil and gas reserves. Um, so, um, you know, new fossil fuel projects are a big sort of problem 
And basically the case against them is pretty, pretty straightforwardly, a lot of recent research saying that um, if we want to get to 1.5 degrees, um, we, we shouldn't be uh, you know, opening um, new, um, at least not opening new fossil fuel um, production um, projects. Uh, and the International Energy Agency, so we heard from Christoph this morning, made that very, very clear last year. And so the basic, in, in short, the basic case is that new fossil fuel projects are inconsistent with low cost pathways to 1.5 degrees. And the basic sort of point about the, the low cost is that, um, at least in the IEA's model, the existing projects are sufficient to meet the, the demand in their scenario, um, subject to, to recent developments. Um, and um, basically that it's more efficient to invest in combination of clean energy and maintaining um, existing projects than it is to, to create new projects. Um, and then there are additional problems, standard, stranded asset risk and other reasons why countries um, might not want to do that. But that's the basic sort of climate case for no new fossil fuel projects. Right, I said that would be sort of basically quick. There are some potential objections. I'm just going to kind of post these again fairly quickly and, and sort of move on. So one is that we might need new supply to meet projected demand um, and to reduce energy prices and enhance energy security. And this is why we, we're, we're not just focusing on the supply side, but also talking about no new, um, you know, at least large scale fossil fuel combustion projects as well. And so clearly there is a need for concerted demand side action. And, and um, Christoph's talk this morning, I think spoke to that nicely. Um, there's a potential equity objection. I'm just gonna, it's kind of complex and it's gonna take too much of my time. So I'm just gonna like park that. If you wanna talk about that, please ask me in the Q and A. Um, clearly as, as Valerie's talk mentioned, well both, both talked really, there's kind of complexities there, but um, just to kind of note that that's a possible objection. And one is that focusing on no new um, projects is only a partial solution, to which the response is yes, it is only a partial solution. I'm not pretending that it's the full solution. Um, but uh, it's nonetheless, I think, a value, valuable partial solution. And just to, to, to substantiate that a little bit, I want to sort of compare the, the argument for like uh, focusing on a full phase out versus for focusing on new projects, um, at, at least you know, as a first step. Um, so we know that getting to 1.5 will require phasing out existing infrastructure before its economic lifetime. There's, we're not dis disputing that, that's clearly necessary. But we also know that stopping new projects will get us a long way to where we need to be. Um, and also stopping new projects would kind of precipitate a sort of fossil fuel industry death spiral, like it would accelerate certain um, financial dynamics in, in the fossil fuel industry that because, you know, declining industries, um, you know, struggle to, um, uh, you know, attract new capital, you know, their, their valuations fall and so on. So that is, would likely affect existing projects as well. Um, but sort of the, so, so, so it would get us actually a long way where we need to be. Um, but also it has these, these other benefits, right? Basically st stopping new projects is much politically easier than stopping new projects and phasing out existing projects. Um, and this is a key sort of attractive attraction of kind of as, a, as an interim measure, at least focusing on, on new projects. So of course, you know, new projects don't have you know, capital invested in them and workers working in them and communities dependent on them. Um, uh, and whereas existing projects do, and of course they lobby to, to protect them. Uh, new projects often up, upset vested interests like land, you know, landowners and so on who have an interest in not having um, uh, new fossil fuel projects. And to some extent may even be possible to get incumbents on board because they benefit from excluding new entrants um, through the price effect. So, so it's politically easier than sort of trying to argue for a, a full phase out of existing fossil fuels. Um, oh yeah, and then there are investment treaty complications of, um, with existing um, projects as well. But it's still difficult, right? So it's still, as we know, very, very politically difficult even to stop um, uh, new fossil fuel projects. So, uh, and sort of the basic idea, the sort of basic model here is pretty intuitive, right? Which is that firms have financial interests in expanding production. And there's sort of, I think, two main reasons for this. One is the sort of profitability under current conditions. So market prices with current, you know, regular, current regulatory environments where there's lots of subsidies and insufficient taxation of externalities and 
and of everything, um, you know, they're profitable. Um, but also even the, a lot of unprofitable projects, I'm thinking here of particularly coal-fired power generation in, in places like China, where they're, they're actually unprofitable, but they're being produced anyway. And that's because of kind of perverse incentives um, to, to, um, for the firms to, to, to grow. Um, and then the basic idea is that, you know, states behave more or less in the interests of their fossil fuel firms, either because the firms are state owned or um, they're kind of state parasitic for all the reasons we're all, all familiar with, that they have exert disproportionate influence on, on policy making. Um, though there are, there are some interesting patterns across different types of democratic systems and capitalist systems. Um, and, um, and this is kind of the bridge to the talking about norms is that ideas are also important and particularly sort of the idea of like the, the social license of different industries kind of affects their political influence. So what can we do about new fossil fuel projects, kind of just continuing this, this sort of uh, issue of the, the political challenges? Well, at the project level, you can challenge individual projects on a project by project basis. Um, but that's, that's hard because, yeah, new projects are assessed individually and often they're subject to like, if they're subject to environmental analysis at all, it's on a marginal basis and, you know, often even scope three emissions where relevant are, are excluded. Um, and so they often, they often go ahead because they only have like sort of a marginal contribution to global emissions um, and even courts rarely, rarely reject them. At a, at a national level, you know, we have all of the domestic political incentives that I spoke about on the last slide, um, at, whereas uh, well familiar problems uh, on the climate side with free rider problem and sort of short, short termism means that these projects go ahead. And because at an international level, there's no global sovereign, so participation in treaties is voluntary. So all of the national level problems and incentives basically infect the, the development and design of international treaties. And there's just simply insufficient current appetite currently um, for any kind of fossil, fossil fuel treaty um, among countries. So the idea is that we should sort of focus our efforts on building a norm against new fossil fuel, fuel projects. So there's already a lot of actors um, calling for action to stop new or and or phase out existing um, uh, fossil fuel production um, or fossil fuel projects more generally. Um, UN Secretary General has been big on this, lots of NGOs, experts and so on calling for that. Um, and our argument is really that this, this effort should in the near term concentrate on new projects for, for the reasons I've, I've outlined um, and, and to basically try and build a global moral and potentially legal norm um, against that. So a norm is basically just a standard of behavior that's expected of a particular actor um, and, and can apply to states. Um, and the basic idea is that, you know, you build a norm through non-state actor mobilization. So articulating and framing that, that norm um, and, and here, like the idea of no new fossil fuel project is really easy to frame. It's very powerful. It's very simple. Um, it's a very kind of intuitive idea. Um, so that, that has lots of benefits in terms of framing, um, framing the norm. And then of course, applying political pressure at these various levels on, on governments to kind of implement that norm through, through, through bans or through other kinds of legislation. And then of course, crucially, it requires states to adopt the norm um, both rhetorically and through implementing it with consistent practice. And this can be aided by pressure from other states, um, the sort of norm, norming effect, like the normalization of the norm, and by institutionalization in international legal, legal texts. Um, so this is basically just sort of my, my kind of final point is that what kind of effect could this have? Well, it could, yeah, this last slide. So basically um, courts could reject and more, be more likely to reject new fossil fuel projects if there's an international legal norm um, against, uh, against new projects. You could potentially tip the political balance so that um, there's, you know, governments are more likely to regulate it. And then that in the longer term would affect the likelihood of getting an international um, treaty. And actually a, a treaty that just banned new projects would actually be really easy to monitor and enforce. And I can explain why in the Q&A. Um, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. So that was the absolute perfect setup for uh, my talks. Thank you for carrying a lot of the heavy lifting on setting up the background. Um, my name is Michelle Bustamante. I am a staff scientist at the Natural Resources Defense Council. 
uh, where we as a group of scientists, uh, legal scholars, and advocates work to protect people on the planet. And specifically, I am trying to take on one of the difficult challenges that was identified of providing a tool that can help to evaluate and push back on individual fossil fuel projects. Um, making the case for why there is opportunity to do that in existing US uh, law. So specifically, the context, uh, this is one of the things I hope to provide today, um, is that the current practices in the United States uh, have been found by courts to be ineffective and insufficient for meeting the legal standards of the US's bedrock environmental law, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. Uh, here, individual projects, for the most part, are how decisions are being made. We all know the, the science problem that we're trying to solve is how do we uh, align our actions with um, limiting warming. But in the policy context, we have to figure out how to make those individual decisions at the level of, say, pipelines or new oil and gas leases uh, reflect um, the fact that, you know, it's not just a drop in the bucket. Um, this is typically what the conclusions of environmental reviews at agencies will tell you. Uh, and one of the main reasons is that their current approach is to benchmark emissions from the project at an annual level uh, to what is being emitted today and uh, look at that as an indication of its significance. They get a really tiny number as a percentage and uh, essentially conclude that there's no significant impact, ignore the climate significance. Um, this reflects incomplete accounting of sometimes downstream emissions, as was pointed out, um, provides this really unhelpful comparison to where we are now versus where we actually need to be going, uh, and lacks any kind of objective basis for determination. So what is a big number? <laughs> uh, and as I said, courts are increasingly finding uh, that the approach is uh, insufficient to, to meet these standards, uh, but the agencies have been able to come back and say, fine, uh, we don't have a tool. Um, we don't know how to do this. So that's where uh, the work that I'm trying to do comes in. Specifically within the, that tiny gap, <laughs> we have an opportunity to uh, design an analytical climate test, um, which is what would be needed to assess the significance of these individual projects and their greenhouse gases uh, using the science that's underlying these high level goals, but taking it down to the level where these decisions are being made from the individual fossil fuel projects. Uh, so taking in things like uh, a well field, you know, plans to do drilling, a gas pipeline, oil pipeline, or a power plant, uh, the test is mathematically uh, asking this question of, is the project consistent with the constraints and the characteristics of limiting our warming to one and a half degree world? Um, and the way that that is being evaluated is by looking at uh, two questions that take in information about um, the one and a half degree world we're describing, which is how much of any one and a half degree carbon budget does this particular project consume? And then how does that compare to its function? What is providing uh, this energy contribution? Is it providing a similar, a commensurate amount of energy to the demands that we would find in the same one and a half degree scenario? If not, uh, it could be argued that it's taking us off course from meeting those policy goals that have been adopted at the highest levels. Uh, so the test is really looking at whether the project emissions impacts towards one and a half degrees outweigh its energy contributions and creating a metric uh, that can be used within these environmental review processes now to inform decisions. Uh, so what I just described is uh, boils down at the end of the day to this really simple metric of the project emissions impacts over the energy contribution. We're both are referring to data coming from uh, climate, um, climate energy system modeling on emissions trajectories at the US level. Um, and energy demand at the US level for fossil fuels. And what's behind this, I'm gonna kind of flick through in the interest of time quickly, uh, is parallel metrics that take in information about the project. Uh, so life cycle emissions of the project and uh, compare it to context of our one and a half degree world, taking into account the fact that there's already existing infrastructure. So for project emissions impacts, that looks like comparing the project's life cycle emissions. So all the way from taking the stuff out of the ground through combusting it um, and comparing that to the emissions trajectory over the time period that the project would be operating. And then in that same time period, looking at what's being eaten up of that carbon budget from existing infrastructure and committed emissions. 
you're still going to get some percentage. You're going to get some number that, you know, say it's 4%. Uh, is that big or is that little? Um, there's really no way to say that <laughs> objectively or, you know, in a reasonable way unless you provide uh, a comparison point. And so we're taking cues from lifecycle assessment methodology to look at its function. Uh, this project's proposed to provide energy. So how well is it doing that? And are those two things in line? Um, so it takes, it looks at the energy supply, the energy that this project supply, uh, and it uh, compares that to the demand for fossil fuels in this climate scenario, taking out existing supply from these committed uh, sources. And in practice, please don't worry about looking at all the details, but I wanted to just kind of give you an idea that um, what I'm describing here is a methodology, but it's also a tool that uh, provides all these calculations and you can go in and, and uh, put in your own data for these climate scenarios, for the project emissions, um, we modeled it on an example gas pipeline project and uh, have submitted this methodology in this demonstration case um, for review uh, for publication, which is currently undergoing, um, and you know, found that from the data uh, in our literature review that the project would consume about 4% of the remaining carbon budget, um, that it would only provide about 1.6% of the energy contribution and that it gives you a score of about 2.5. And so one thing that I kind of glossed over is the, uh, one of the things that is really strong about this approach is it gives you a simple and easy to interpret decision point of one, where emissions impact and energy contribution should ideally be aligned, meaning that the project is consuming an equal share of uh, both. Uh, in this case, you get a number that is clearly over one, about two and a half, tells you its emissions impacts are two and a half times what they should be, uh, and that it therefore has significant impact um, in driving further warming. But it also tells you information about how far off it might be from where it uh, would need to be to be aligned. So uh, this gives us the ability to compare between alternatives, to consider uh, things like emission mitigation uh, for projects, and to work within the system of review. Uh, so one of the things you may be thinking right, right away is, well, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a projection-based uh, activity, so there's a lot of things about the future of how the project might operate or what the exact details of the climate scenario might be that are uncertain, Michelle. What, how can you know what they will be? Uh, so to sort of uh, not run away from that, to lean into it, we did a Monte Carlo analysis where I varied everything from how long the project operates to what specific climate scenario you're looking at to uh, the, you know, the, what percentile of the emissions impact uh, for the life cycle assessment um, this project would provide and found 10,000 simulations, only about a little bit over 1% for a gas pipeline example um, in the US could theoretically be considered consistent with a one and a half degree scenario. Uh, and what are those, all those scenarios have in common, it requires the pipeline only to operate for about four years. Um, so I, I sort of throw that to the policymakers to decide, is that reasonable? Uh, is that something that is a worthwhile investment? Um, so as I mentioned, this is a, method, a methodology, but also a tool. So right now it's in a beautiful little spreadsheet model that <laughs> I have made myself, uh, but it allows you to jump in there, customize your inputs, uh, provides default values, um, and provide scenario options for the people who are working at these agencies to use directly to help them in making these decisions. Uh, generates these you know, results pretty much instantaneously. It's not doing any climate modeling itself. It's just you know, using existing scenarios. Uh, so you get fast results and clear interpretation with all of the calculations provided in the document. Um, you can see it for yourself. So uh, I want to just highlight quickly before my time is up that we applied this recently to a real project and submitted it to a comment docket um, <laughs> where we found uh, uh, for the Willow oil and gas project in Alaska and uh, were able to make the argument very clearly that the only alternative uh, of those proposed that would be uh, not creating significant climate impact would be the no action alternative. Uh, unsurprising, but true. And we were able to sort of robustly show that. So ultimately, we're just trying to help bend the curve by uh, stopping individual new proposals. And uh, there's a lot of further work to do, including some of the future stuff I want to do in ec economics mm -hmm. and local impacts. And I will stop. So thank you.
I'm Max Cohen. I'm from UBC, University of British Columbia. Uh, this paper is on field work I've been doing in Shetland Islands, um, which is the most northerly region of Britain. Um, uh, two months of field work there, interviews with local community members and members of local government. Um, and the paper's title comes uh, Geographies of Delay. Delay is a sort of it's a term that's emerged in recent critiques of the fossil fuel industry of post postponing action, climate action into the future. And so the argument I make in this paper is that delay is also sort of embedded in the everyday geographies of, of local places as well. And it's not just a top down strategy of fossil fuel companies. And so I'm interested in and how that's working in Shetland. Shetland is also so I'll outline my outline here. Um, I'll situate Shetland within what I call Britain's fast political economy of oil since the 1970s. Um, then look at the geographies of delay in the energy transition and offer some, some concluding thoughts. Um, Shetland is also the windiest place in the United Kingdom. And so they're developing a lot of wind farms there at the, at the, at the current state. Um, so Shetland is located about equidistant between Norway and Scotland. Um, it's an old Viking settlement. And a local journalist calls it a sort of more of a transatlantic crossroads than a British backwater. It's, a, it's been home to sort of international movements from Viking traders to Hanseatic merchants to fishing vessels to oil companies and now to renewable investment. And so it's um, quite an interesting, important place in Britain's history. Um, it was handed over to Scotland in the 15th century as a dowry payment by the King of Denmark at the time, Christian I. He, wasn't, he didn't have enough money, essentially, to pay Scotland, and so he gave Shetland to Scotland. Shetland is roughly about 60% or 67% of the UK's claim to North Sea oil, and so if that king had enough money, then Norway would have about 60% of uh, the UK's North Sea oil. Um, and so it's a really important part of the UK's North Sea story. Um, and I argue, actually, it's caught between its sort of Norwegian history and, and or Norse history and, and the British one. And then through the oil era, it ended up taking a bit more of a Norwegian approach to managing oil and gas reserves than a, than a British approach through oil field welfare and, and local industrial development. Um, so just the context of that was um, in the 1970s, uh, UK was the sort of sick man of Europe and really had to get that. A lot of interviewees told me they had to get the bloody oil ashore. That was very good to me. Um, and in 1973 is the oil, international oil crisis. And Shetland becomes sort of indispensable to the oil companies and the UK because to build a pipeline from um, the North Sea to the UK mainland, it costs between half a million and a million pounds per mile. And so the cheaper option was to land it at Shetland first. And so they built an oil terminal there called Sulem Vo. Um, it's this big oil terminal here. Um, and it's bang in the middle of sort of the Brent fields. I'll just go back, sorry, to this slide just to kind of contextualize this a bit more. But um, in the 1970s uh, as well, this, uh, 1974, Scotland also has a kind of oil nationalism which arises at this time. Um, and the Scottish National Party won their first kind of major elect or 11 seats in the parliament on the basis of a kind of this is Scotland's oil campaign. And so this is the kind of political context of this terminal. Um, it's a, basically this terminal is a transshipment port. So the oil and gas is piped ashore from the Ninian fields and the Brent fields. Brent is a really important crude oil. Um, it's the kind of marker on international world markets. People talk about Brent oil. Um, and then international tankers come in and take it away. But there's no oil refinery on Shetland. And so oil, Shetland has some of the highest fossil fuel costs in Britain, and actually some of the highest fuel, rates of fuel poverty. Is a, um, it's a very cold and windy place. And so a lot of the housing stock is badly insulated, um, which adds to that. But because the oil and gas is exported and then imported back, um, it experiences a lot of energy poverty problems as well. Um, oil create a lot of transformations, and I don't have time to sort of run through them all on the islands. Um, sort of spatial transformations, a lot of the towns like the capital were transformed into service bases for the oil industry. Um, this is something I'm really interested in. Shetland has a really unique ecology. It's got a lot of wildlife, like otters and birds. And a lot of local ecologists were hired by the oil industry 
since the 70s to monitor Shetland's wildlife and to facilitate extraction. And this was a video made by BP, um, which sort of details the sort of symbiotic relationship between the terminal and Shetland's wildlife. It's a really fascinating video you can watch. Um, and I'm writing a paper on the kind of ecological angle to it, the relationship between Shetland's understanding of ecology and how oil influenced that as well. Um, Shetland is a massive, people call it a massive peat bog. And this, has, this is really important for thinking about the transition. Um, peat is only in the past 10 or so years been recognised as an important carbon sink, as well as an important biodiversity source. Um, and when the oil era arrived in the 1970s, uh, they could basically just chuck the peat away and make way for the oil terminal. Um, but wind farm developments now have to have a sort of peat uh, management process or a peat reinstatement project. And there's a lot of debate over whether the carbon payback from digging up that peat is enough for when the wind farms are being developed. A lot of the wind farms are also being connected to the oil and gas infrastructure to electrify the platforms for uh, extraction and to turn the platforms net zero. Um, there's also one more peat example, <laughs> trying to tie it all in, is there's a gas plant um, that's built in Sulemvo oil terminal that pipes gas ashore and they're doing a really total on that plant and they have hired a PhD student to, uh, they basically put all the peat in a massive box and a big container and setting their pouring kind of water on it and keeping it alive. And they asked the PhD student to whether this is, and then they're going to chuck the peat back into Shetland and re reinstate it. And their question to the PhD student said, is this still a peat bog when you reinstate it? And he'd spent 40 years on it and I asked him, and he said, it's not a peat bog anymore. But you can go, you can go and visit this big box and it's a massive box of peat. It's a really fascinating thing that's going on. So there's the ecological transformations as well. Um, I'll skip this. But Shetland has three traditional industries. Um, and they were all affected and lost a lot of labour to what people call the golden handcuffs of the oil industry. Um, but they play a really important part in Shetland's economy today as well. Um, this is the Shetland Charitable Trust, which was developed in the 70s to manage the oil money. So the, the council negotiated a deal in the 70s, which was for every barrel of oil onshore, uh, they would take a third of a penny. And today, this charitable trust distributes the oil money throughout Shetland society and sort of arts, culture, heritage, a lot of environmental um, uh, sort of initiatives as well. And it's worth half a billion pounds now. Um, and so it's a similar sort of welfare fund with which the Norwegians have, which is roughly about a trillion. And so the UK's oil and gas economy has been referred to as a wasted windfall because the UK government essentially didn't save up any of the oil in gas money. The Thatcher government essentially spent it on tax cuts uh, and welfare payments during deindustrialisation and restructuring in the 70s, whereas Shetland saved a sort of trust. And so they've invested and will invest a lot in the wind farm developments. Um, and these are quotes which sort of capture that alternative trajectory of development, um, which I quite like that second one, which is quite good. <laughs> Um, but this has to be contextualised and really taken by a pinch of salt as well, because Shetland um, has some of the highest rates of fuel poverty in Britain and also um, has some of the fo highest fossil fuel costs in the UK as well. And so it's not a, it's not a utopia, as I was trying to portray in these quotes, but it's an interesting sort of alternative trajectory. OK, so I don't know how long we've got left, but I'll try and, um, try and capture some of this. There's a lot because Shetland is the windiest place. In the UK, um, there's a lot going on with the transition, a lot of wind farm developments. And I'll just focus on one case study, which is the Viking Energy Wind Farm. Um, uh, these are protests which are happening over an oil field to the west of Shetland, um, which was actually was a, originally a shell project. And they pulled out after um, some norms arose in, in civil society and, 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 and government. Um, but the project's been taken over by a small in independent firm. So the context of the transition is it's being sort of, uh, extraction still happening. And a lot of the oil companies are funding a lot of the research into it. Um, so this is, this is a picture of me at the wind farm. And the reason I put it up is because uh, it's a, a lot of the oil and gas companies used to do a lot of kind of PR exercises. And I went to visit the wind farm and I got given this suit to wear and it was the very shiny suit. <laughs> And it looked very different 
from everyone else who was at the wind farm and it was a really and I got like my photo taken and stuff. So it was a really interesting sort of PR exercise of what's going on. But this project is it's going to be the biggest onshore wind farm, uh, one of the biggest in the UK. Um, 445 megawatt turbines, which will be the equivalent to powering 45 Shetlands. Um, so a big part of this project is they're building an interconnector between Shetland and the UK grid. So Shetland is not connected to the national grid. Um, a lot of home, and it doesn't, so it's not connected to the gas network as well, which contributes to a lot of the high rates of fuel poverty as well. Um, and so this uh, interconnector will connect the excess um, supply of electricity, take it to Shetland, and then they'll re-import electricity as well. Um, and because of so much electricity from it, a lot of the electricity from that as well is based on electrifying offshore oil and gas rigs. Um, now, this project okay, was um, planned in 2003, um, but due to 17 years of protest, because it's going right through the middle of Shetland, it's um, sort of up ripping the spine, as they call it, some of the protesters are calling it, and they've also raised the peat issue, um, is that it went to the highest court in the UK, and eventually it was passed. Um, that body, the Shetland Charitable Trust, who are that, or the oil fund, had a 50% stake in the wind farm. Um, but because it eventually became unprofitable for them to keep their stake and they've pulled out, so it's now 100, almost 100% owned um, by a company called, uh, a multinational company abroad. Um, so there's interesting lessons to be learned there about renewable investment as well. So I'll just, I'll stop there. But thanks. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So we've got about 15 or so minutes to have an open discussion. And uh, so, and just to kind of, some of you came in a little bit later, just to give an overarch of what I was hearing, we have Valerie looking at emerging producers who are trying to manage that tension between oil and gas and transition readiness. Calium showed us how that's being manifested, deep dived with the Trinidad, Tobago, and Guyana cases. Max has shown us how a well-established producer is now seeking to take off those golden handcuffs, I love that phrase, um, and maybe along the way re-entrenching oil development through, for example, using wind power offshore. Fergus is telling us about that the need for a new norm to stop new fossil fuel projects um, his presentation include my favorite, included my favorite phrase of the conference so far, which was the fossil fuel death spiral. <laughs> I'm going to take that one away. And Michelle is showing a tool on the ground to assess these new projects and hopefully contribute to being able to stop them as that norm uh, develops. So what I'm going to do is take a batch of like three or four questions, and uh, hopefully there'll be enough for everybody to dig into here, and uh, we'll see how time goes from then. So I am going to start right from the back. So the person right there, you please, and um, and then you next, and then well, you know what? Let's do these three here. Okay. 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 Hi. Um, hi, I'm Chloe Ferrand. I'm a journalist. I write for Climate Home News. Um, I've got a question for uh, Valerie, but I think Fergus maybe might want to join in as well. Um, it was really interesting that you said that 80% of uh, the countries that you were talking to were saying that they were there was no alternative uh, to this oil pathway or oil and gas pathway that they were uh, considering. Um, I mean, should what kind of process should be put into place internationally to develop alternatives? Um, I mean, who should be doing it? How might it be set up? Like, what is the a, a way that means that these um, countries and government officials could be brought on board, um, and I guess kind of that maybe links into this to this norm. I don't know, Fergus, you might just want to explain a bit how that links in and um, j just kind of clarify the legal status of it as well. I've, I don't think I got that point. Thank you. Okay, great. And then into the center here, and then we have a cluster of three in the front, so it'll be nice and easy. Okay. Um, I actually had a few questions. I hope it's all right to to mention them. Um, so I, on the Guyana project, I, I know that there was the, there's a department for Amerindian affairs in Guyana, and I wondered if, like, how, how that, um, that's been integrated into the um, uh, sort of assessment process. Um, uh, on the, the Shetlands, I wondered if it was, um, if it, there was ever a consideration of doing like a collective ownership of the wind farm, like modeling on the welfare 
uh, sort of model for oil and gas on um, on the sort of assessment tool for new um, oil and gas infrastructure. I wondered um, it, it, if everyone understood correctly, it's for new projects. So um, is it not, uh, or maybe maybe you already kind of covered this, but is it not possible to say no new projects in your in your sort of context that you're working in? Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, ha, ha, how if it sec secondly or separately, how does it integrate sort of like whose emissions should be part of that 1.5 um, like come budget sort of thing? So sorry, thanks for indulging. Thank no, it's great. I don't think there's a quota yet. <laughs> Question quota. <laughs> All right, and then there's three folks here in the very front. Zach, thank you so much for your help. Kathy, this is fun. <laughs> we could juggle it later. Um, thank you for the presentations. This is all like so interesting. So I'm going to limit myself um, to one for Michelle. And I, I say fun. And I think this is fantastic. And I love the way you've set it out. It seems very likely that no project is ever going to clear that, which gets me wondering whether the fact that that sort of the, the reality of the world we're still living in and where we want to be are so far apart will actually just invite j judges to say, well, that can't be. Or, you know, it, will they somehow just reject it out of hand because they don't, they live in that current world? Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, I'm a PhD student from University of Southampton and econ Economics and so thank you all for your presentation. I actually have a uh, question for Dr. Uh, Bob Green, Green from the UCL and I'm curious about the uh, uh, economic challenges for uh, you know the developing countries uh, for them to you know phase out uh, from the new uh, fossil fuel projects or just stop new uh, fossil fuel projects and uh, because I have noticed that you have mentioned uh, much about the uh, political challenges uh, but uh, I want to know more about the uh, biggest uh, economic challenges they have and and maybe your advice for them to uh, uh, stop the new fossil fuels projects. Thank you. Hi, my name is Adrian. I'm with RMI, and I just wanted to thank you for your presentations. Uh, my question is to Michelle. Uh, in your equation, I noticed the numerator is the lifetime of the project. I was curious how you determine the time scale for the denominator of your equation and how you account for projects that retire within that time scale um, or their emissions number or energy they produce change within that time scale. Okay, so who would like to take the first crack? And I should say we only have about 10 minutes left, so let's be satisfying yet brief. <laughs> Who'd like to go first? Do you want to go? Okay, please go ahead. Um, thank you. Just to, to remind you, the question was around the alternative pathway, so plan B. Um, I think that's a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question because what is needed and who should do it, maybe it's hard to find the, the match between that, those two, but to, I think what is needed is um, like a country-specific industrial pathway, uh, like a green industrial pathway, so, or a country-specific decarbonization plan. And uh, those are far and few between because they're sort of off-the-shelf uh, uh, ill-adapted to the national realities, uh, politically, economically, and whatnot. Um, and I think um, the, the other issue is that um, the countries that I was talking about don't attract that kind of interest from donors or MDBs or, uh, you know, the development agencies uh, because they're not yet uh, you know, Nigeria's and, and, and of the world. Um, so there's little interest in doing that for them. Um, but uh, I think also in the what, it would need to be done as an open process, 
to to actually capture the interest in the political interest of in the country. So not just to have the answers ready that the outcome has to be you will leave it into the ground, but to have a more nuanced discussion about what actually if fits for your country and can minimize damage for the climate globally. Um, yep. Should I, should I follow on from Please. yeah? Um, so yeah, to Chloe's question. So just to follow on from that, but maybe taking it from the from starting with the norms question. So if you think about you know norm is really just a, a standard of behaviour, um, and ideally a, a relatively clear standard of behaviour. There are other international norms against nuclear testing, against piracy, against landmines, and um, there's often a kind of close overlap between these sort of moral norms as they're promoted, usually initially by sometimes international organizations, but usually by NGOs. Um, and, and eventually states take them on and states, and, and that's sort of crucial to them becoming legal norms is that states endorse them and then states adopt them and implement them. And then the other states feel pressure to adopt them and implement them because it's becoming normal. So um, to answer sort of the last part of your question about well, so far, this is kind of just an emerging norm. It's being promoted by uh, NGOs and others, but but sort of not not as clearly as I think it could be. Um, so I think there could be a kind of laser-like focus on that norm, and then getting countries to kind of endorse it and, and adopt it would be sort of crucial um, to its sort of development as a certainly as a legal international legal norm. And then that connects to the how that connects to the the the, the sort of first part of your question about. Um, the, the, the plan B that, that, that Valerie spoke to for these countries is that for a lot of countries to endorse that norm, it would have to be part of a wider package of ne negotiations about, okay, well, how are you going to actually support us so that we can develop and we can meet our legitimate needs for energy services and so on? And that gets to sort of the, the equity question. And so, so in practice, for a number of states to endorse and implement that norm, there would have to be a sort of wider set of negotiations. And I think that's where those two questions line up. Um, yeah, those two issues kind of meet one another at that point. Go ahead, Colin. I, I, yeah, so um, I'm going to get to the Amerindian question, but just I wanted to add to, to that point that Valerie made on the uh, it's sort of tailored development pathways, uh, decarbonization pathways tailored to, to some of these countries. And um, that's exactly what what um, um, I looked at and worked on in the Guyana small producer context. Um, so uh, between 2015 and 2020, there was a different political regime in that country. And um, uh, there was still sort of the new oil fines at that time. And um, I actually was commissioned to do the country's national climate change policy at that time. Uh, the UN uh, folks were in there also advocating for a green economy strategy around this. Um, then all of that was done. The national climate policy was done. A green economy strategy was, was done. And then the government changed. And those things were shelved. And the new government brought in its own tailored development plan, which was called a low carbon development plan. So sort of it, but it took elements of the previous government's plans. It's just the new government wanted to stamp its own sort of reputation on a new plan. Um, I think so. So, so these are things that happen. Now, the, the the bigger issue for me here is that, regardless of which political administration came into power, and even if that flips again, all of them are basically on the wrong the same route. Uh, we're, we are going to fast pace the oil and gas sector and use the dividends um, uh, to chart a low carbon or green economy. There's no political philosophy held by any party in that country that says otherwise than that. So that's a that's um, sort of a, an interesting play there. Um, with regards to the uh, the Amerindian Affairs question, yes. So um, all of the oil and gas activity is currently offshore. Uh, there is um, the, the plan in there to onshore natural gas. And there's also a plan. So in this, the geography of this country is that the most of the uh, urban settlement, 80% um, of the population is near the coast, within uh, 20 miles of the coast. 
Um, so, and this is below sea level. So with rising sea levels, the idea is to move a lot of these folks inland. Now that's going to affect, depending on where they go, this is going to affect the Amerindian um, um, communities that live further inland. Um, um, so that, that is a question. There's also a sort of a, a flip side to this where prior to oil and gas, um, um, the main economic act drivers in this country have been gold mining in the interior affecting Amerindian communities um, and um, bauxite mining again. So very deleterious to the uh, uh, forest environment, but also sort of having s significant sort of health issues, mercury and so on for the Amerindian communities. So conceivably, and this is conceivably, if the economy shifts to um, um, gaining some dividends from the oil and gas offshore and transitioning to cleaner industry, uh, uh, economic activities, uh, whatever that might be, services, what have you, as we move forward and they move away from those natural resource ex extractive industries in the interior where the Amerindian communities are, conceivably that could, that could be a plus, right? Um, but all of this is, is, is sort of theoretical at this point and it's left to be seen. So we literally have one minute, Max and Michelle, would you like to share that one minute between you? Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> I think you have 30 uh, seconds each, but. Right. Um, Scott, uh, so the collective ownership question, uh, that's just a question I was asking as well. So there is one community owned one farm in Shetland and they've got a really successful project. It's quite small, it's five turbines and they sell it to the Shetland grid and then reinvest the money in their local community. And that's, that's quite successful. But the big Viking one was the way the what they wanted to get community benefit was the government had the local government had a fifty percent stake, but because of the protests, um, there was seventeen years kind of delay, and then eventually um, it became there's the way that the UK government subsidises um, contracts is through something called contracts for difference, and it's basically a subsidy um, for people to enter into a renewable project. Um, these contracts tend to favour people with deeper pockets and companies with bigger companies. And so the council said that after the protests, it became unaffordable for them to have their stakes. So they pulled out and now it's 99% owned by a multinational company. Um, there's a lot of blame gaming in Shetland. Like they, they, a lot of people in the council blame the protesters for delaying the project, but I think which is true. But there's also the UK government kind of prospect kind of context, which is not actively facilitating community ownership which I think we could do a better job of. But. Yeah. OK, so uh, I'm going to try and combine some questions I heard. But um, basically, uh, on this idea of uh, can't we just say no fossil fuels? <laughs> I would love that to be possible um, just on the basis, like I said, we all saw the IEA report. Uh, but in the US, the specific legal context is such that um, it's almost it's sort of been tried by the Biden administration to uh, ban or like to stop pause offshore leasing and courts did not uphold that ability. Um, so in the absence of further legislation, this is sort of the situation we're at. And uh, what we hope to do with the tool is to be able to answer the question that the agencies do have to answer and to confront them with this information and force them to defend how they can still make that, con that conclusion to approve a project if it's three or four times um, you know, taking us off the, the goals that the same administration has uh, committed to elsewhere. So uh, happy to follow up on the more specific question, Adrian, afterwards. All right, thank you. It was been such a pleasure learning from you. And there's a coffee break now until quarter past, so uh, continue the conversation, okay? Thank you both. Thank you.